Hi there, and welcome to my three-part series on how to read financial statements like Warren Buffett. As investors, understanding a company's financial statements is crucial to making informed investment decisions. In this video, we will focus on the balance sheet and its key components, assets, liabilities, and equity. These are the basics, and along the way, I will be mentioning what Buffett looks for in a company. I recently came across a book that enhanced my understanding of financial statements and investing, called Warren Buffett and the Interpretation of Financial Statements, the search for the company with a durable competitive advantage, written by Mary Buffett and David Clark. Even though it is a very easy read, this book is an absolute must read for anyone looking to improve their financial literacy and investment strategies. As we all know, Warren Buffett started investing the Ben Graham way, who is the father of value investing. Back then, Buffett would look for Scarbats. These weren't necessarily the best companies in the business world, but their stock prices usually traded at a significant discount to their book value, in which, if you were to invest in them, there was a good chance you could get that one last puff from them. However, after meeting with Charlie Munger, Warren started to develop his investing strategy. He started to look for companies with long-term durable competitive advantage over their competitors. To quote from Munger, if you buy something because it is undervalued, then you have to think about selling it when it approaches your calculation of its intrinsic value. That's art. But if you buy a few great companies, then you can sit on your ass. That's a good thing. Simply not overpaying and holding for a very, very long time in these kinds of businesses were the key to get rich. And in this video, we will be looking at how to read a balance sheet and what to look for to determine a business with long-term durable competitive advantage. Let's get started. A balance sheet is a financial statement that shows a company's financial position at a specific point in time. It is divided into two main sectors, assets and liabilities. Assets are the resources a company owns, such as cash, property, and inventory. Liabilities are the debts and obligations a company owes, such as loans and accounts payable. The difference between a company's assets and liabilities is known as shareholders' equity, which represents the value of the company's stock and retained earnings. For this video, I will be using Moody's and Coca-Cola's balance sheets as examples. I believe these are good examples of those businesses with durable competitive advantage. And Buffett certainly thinks so as well. Moody's has been a Berkshire holding for 23 years and Coca-Cola for 35 years. As you can see, there are two types of assets on the balance sheet. First is current assets. These are the ones that are expected to be able to turn to cash in less than one year. And then the company also owns long-term assets. These are the kinds of assets that are expected to take more than one year to be turned into cash. Let's start with current assets, also known as working assets. And the reason it is called working assets is the company uses them to buy more inventories, which then, once they are sold, they become accounts receivable. And then, once collected, they are back to cash. That is a cycle of cash. That cycle repeats itself over and over again. That is how the businesses make money. Now, going down the list, first we have cash and cash equivalents. That is basically cash or short-term investments that can be turned into cash in a very short time. If the company has a high number in that line, that can either mean that company's business is going well and generating lots of cash, or that might also mean that company has sold a portion of their business or issued new equity or bonds, which may not always be good for the investor. If the number on that line is low, that generally means the company has inferior economics. So if the company earns a lot more than it spends, that means they will start to have a pile of cash rising, and the problem becomes what to do with it. Paying dividends, doing buybacks, acquisitions, and other things, or simply letting it pile up for rainy days. For example, as of third quarter of 2022, Google currently has $116 billion in total current assets. Most of the time, a company that has surplus of cash from operations over the years has a durable advantage that Buffett is looking for. If the company is having a short-time problem that is causing the Wall Street to dump the stock and make it go on sale while the company has a good amount of cash to help them weather the storm, that's mostly a good entry point for Warren Buffett. Good companies very rarely go on sale, but once they do, that is an incredible opportunity for us investors. The final thing that Buffett looks for here is to make sure to go back at least seven years and look to see if the cash is being created from ongoing operations or issuing bonds, equity, or selling parts of the business. Obviously, Buffett wants cash to be created by operations. Now, let's pick up the pace a little bit. Next in line, we have inventories, but obviously, Moody's is not a good example for it. So let's look at Coca-Cola. Rather than the number in that line, the thing that an investor needs to be focusing on is if the company's inventory going out of fashion. For example, we all know Coca-Cola. It's been the same for decades. So the inventory of Coca-Cola is not as important as a chip maker where every year's chip is so much better than the last year's. Another important thing to check for here is checking to see if profits are rising along with inventories. That means the company is just making sure it has enough supply to cover demand. 
But if the inventory is going up and down a lot every year, that might mean the business is in a very competitive field and you may want to stay clear of it. Next up, we have accounts receivable. There is only one thing to check here, which is accounts receivable to total sales ratio and comparing the number to other businesses in the same sector. Obviously, lower the number, the better. Next in line is prepaid expense, which means the expenses the company paid in forward. Might be insurance, for example. This line doesn't really matter. Now we have total current assets. In that line, there is a ratio that analysts have to cover, which is the current ratio. It is calculated by dividing current assets by current liabilities. Higher the ratio, the better with 1 meaning current assets equal to current liabilities equal to minimum number expected by some investors. But funny thing here is great businesses like Coca-Cola and Moody's ratios can be under 1. Currently, we are in a beer market and both of them are over 1. But in 2018, Coca-Cola's current ratio was 0 0.9 and in 2019, it was 0 0.8. While Procter & Gamble's current ratio has been under 1 for every year since 2017. And the reasoning is those companies' earnings power is so strong that they can cover current liabilities. Another reason is banks know their earnings power, and when they need it, they can easily get financing. Now we have the longest line in the balance sheet, which I will just be calling property and plants. There really is not any specific thing to look for here. However, there are some very important things to watch in the longer terms. If a company has durable competitive advantage, they really don't have to renew their production facilities that much. We are using Coca-Cola example here again. And as we all know, 10 years ago, the coke that we drink was the same. Coca-Cola only has to suffer amortization costs. However, a company like GM has to renew their production lines much more frequently and that causes a lot of money for the company. If you are producing a consistent product like Coca-Cola, you really don't need a lot of money to constantly upgrade the production means, which is always nice to see for investors. Next up, we have Goodwill. I will make it very short. To quote from the book, when Exxon by XYZ oil company and Exxon pays a price in excess of XYZ's book value, the excess is recorded on Exxon's balance sheet as goodwill. No takeaways for me in this line. Now we have intangible assets. These are the things that are not in physical form, such as copyrights, patents and so forth. The important thing to watch out here is that you can't really put Coca-Cola's name value in here. What I mean is, if there is two types of Coke and both are the same, one with Coca-Cola's name and the other is something else, consumers would likely choose Coca-Cola but brand name can't really be put on a balance sheet. For that reason, I don't think this line matters that much. Next up, we have long-term investments, and I wanted to add a new Berkshire investment TSM for this line. This line represents the value of companies' long-term investments, meaning more than one year, such as bonds, stocks, and so forth. Now, this line can represent a very valuable asset at a much cheaper price, and the reasoning is that the company can't show this line above its cost. Also, this line is mostly how Buffett built Berkshire. For example, Berkshire's investment in Apple is represented in this line. And on the final line of assets side, we have the total assets, calculated by combining current assets and long-term assets. Total assets equals total liabilities and shareholders' equity, which is why it is called a balance sheet. Total assets help with calculations to measure how efficient the company is. Most known ratio is return on assets ratio, which is calculated by dividing company's net earnings to its assets. To give some examples of return on assets, Apple is at 28%, Google 22%, Coca-Cola 11%, Moody's 16%, and GM is at 4%. With that, we conclude the assets part. Now, let's go to liabilities. Our current liabilities. Current liabilities mean the debt the company has to pay within the fiscal year. First line we have accounts payable, accrued expenses, and other current liabilities. It is the money a company owes to suppliers that provide goods and services to the company with credit. Accrued expenses are liabilities that the company has incurred but has yet to be invoiced for, such as wages payable, accrued rent, and so forth. Other than to help us compare the company's short-term and long-term debt situation, this line doesn't really help us with determining the company's long-term durable advantage. Next up, we have short-term debt. I want to highlight one thing, which is not every line can be found on every balance sheet, or some can just say short-term debt Whereas in Coca-Cola's balance sheet, it is loans and notes payable, which is the debt they need to pay within 12 months, which includes commercial paper and short-term bank loans. Now, this line is very important when analyzing a bank. Short-term money is historically cheaper than long-term money. You can get short-term at 5% and long-term at 7%. And then you can lend your short-term borrowed money for long-term and make 2% profits. That is very roughly how banks work. But the smart and safe way is to borrow long-term and then lending long term, because interest rates can change in the short term and you can end up in a very rough spot where your borrowed money's interest is bigger than what you lend it for. So you want to compare short term debt to long term and compare the number among peers to get a better understanding. Now we have current maturities of long term debt. 
which represents the part of long-term debt that has to be paid within 12 months. The thing to remember here is companies with durable advantage doesn't need that much long-term debt to maintain their business. So they don't really have much long-term debt coming due. So if a company has a lot of long-term debt that is coming due, it most likely does not have a durable advantage. Now we have total current liabilities. This is the total liabilities that is due in 12 months. We have talked about the current ratio on the asset side, so I'm just gonna skip this part. Now that we are done with current liabilities, let's go to long-term debt. Long-term debt means that the debt matures any time more than a year out. Warren Buffett pays a great attention to this part. As we have previously discussed, great companies very rarely need long-term debt, so they don't carry much long-term debt in their balance sheets. Because they are so profitable, they can cover the expansion and acquisition cost with their own profits easily. But of course, in business, there can be time even the good companies with long-term durable advantage goes into trouble. So there can be times they carry long-term debt on their balance sheet. One good approach is to look 5 to 10 years back and then seeing how much long-term debt they carried over those years. If the company always has lots of long-term debt compared to its size, there is a good chance that that business does not have a competitive advantage. In the book, writers say that Warren looks for long-term debt to be under 3 or 4 times current earnings. So if a company is making $100 million in earnings, the debt that is tolerable is around $400 million. After that, it becomes a highly leveraged business, which means that your margin of safety shrinks significantly. For example, while Ford has around $10 billion in earnings, their long-term debt is more than $80 billion. Now we have deferred income tax. It is a tax that's been due but has not been paid. It's not really important, so I'll just pass it. What is more interesting is non-controlling assets. By the way, this is Berkshire's balance sheet. Non-controlling interest is when a company buys another company's stock, it goes under long-term investments. However, if they buy more than 80%, other company's entire balance sheet is acquired onto the company's balance sheet as well. Same with income statement. So if you buy 90% of another company but transfer all of its earnings to your income statement, this line represents the rest 10% of the income. Now we have total liabilities, which is the sum of all liabilities of the company. In and of itself, it doesn't mean much, but with it, we calculate debt to shareholders equity ratio. And shareholders equity is the difference between total assets and total liabilities. In other words, the book value. The equation is very simple. Total liabilities divided by shareholders equity. But this equation is very tricky because great companies usually don't need to carry a large amount of equity and retain earnings in their balance sheet. And since they don't need it, that money goes to the buybacks, which in return decreases the base of the formula, making it looking worse. So it makes better sense to use the numbers adjusted for share buybacks. And in adjusted numbers, if it is not a financial institution, adjusted debt to shareholders equity ratio below 0.80 means that the business most likely has the durable competitive advantage we are looking for. Shareholders equity, also known as stockholders equity, represents the amount of money that would be left over for shareholders if a company were to liquidate all of its assets and pay off all of its liabilities. In other words, it is the amount of money that would be left over for shareholders after all other obligations have been met. Shareholders equity is made up of two main components, capital stock and retained earnings. Capital stock represents the amount of money that shareholders have invested in the company through the purchase of stock. Retained earnings represents the amount of money that the company has earned and kept rather than distributing it to shareholders as dividends. It is important to note that shareholders' equity can also be negative, also known as deficit. This means that the company's liabilities exceed its assets and the company would not have any money left over shareholders if it were to liquidate all of its assets and pay off all of its liabilities. In summary, shareholders' equity is a measure of a company's net worth and represents the amount of money that would be left over for shareholders if the company were to be liquidated. It is an important metric for investors to consider when evaluating a company's financial health. Here we have preferred and common stock, and I wanted to explain the difference. Other than getting loans from financial institutions, a company can raise capital by two ways. First is selling bonds which need to be paid back at a certain time with interest. And the second is by selling equity, which the company does not have to do any sort of payback, but also represents an ownership, and this way is called common stock. But there is another way of selling equity, which is called preferred stock. Preferred stock owners do not have the voting rights. However, they have the rights to receive fixed or adjustable dividend that has to be paid before common stockholder dividends. Also, if the company goes bankrupt, they have priority against common stockholders. Most of the time, companies that have durable competitive advantage do not have preferred stock simply because they do not need it. The one before the final line, we have retained earnings. When a company makes a profit but doesn't distribute it through the dividend or use it to do share buybacks, it goes to the balance sheet in this line, retained earnings. This number is accumulated, which means that every year the company is making profits and keeping it in the business 
this number gets bigger. However, if the company is not making profits and is losing money, it gets deducted. And this number is incredibly important. Out of all the lines, this one can be the most important one. The growth of a company's retained earnings can tell us so much about the company's long-term durable advantage. Here, we have the 2018 balance sheet for Moody's, and we can see that their retained earnings number is $8.5 billion, but now it is $12.7 billion, which means that in the last three years, it has grown at 14% CAGR, which is simply great. I know this has been very long, but this is the last thing we will cover, and it is the treasury stock. When a company does buybacks, it can basically do two things with it. First, it can cancel them for good, or they can keep it with the possibility of reissuing later on. If it is kept, it goes into the balance sheet under the name of treasury stock. Treasury stocks have no voting and won't get paid dividends. They are kept as a negative line in the balance sheet because they represent a reduction in the shareholders' equity. Companies with long-term durable advantage have lots of money that they can do buybacks with. Therefore, if we see a treasury stock line in the balance sheet, it might be an indicator of a great company that we are looking for. One thing to look out for here is that when a company buys and holds its own shares as treasury stock, it decreases equity and increases return on shareholders' equity. To determine if this is due to financial engineering or strong business economics, add the negative value of treasury shares to shareholders' equity and divide the company's net earnings by the new total. This gives the return on equity minus financial engineering effects. Now, when it comes to shareholders' equity, the ratio that is most commonly used is return on shareholders' equity. Shareholders' equity represents a company's assets minus its liabilities and includes capital from stock sales, retained earnings, and paid-in capital. This equity belongs to the common shareholders, and management's efficiency in utilizing it is measured by the return on shareholders' equity equation. Net earnings divided by shareholders' equity. For example, Pepsi in the last three years is at 50%, 50%, and at 51%. However, in highly competitive industries, such as automobile, returns tend to be lower. For example, Ford in the last three years is at 0.1%, minus 4%, and 45%. High returns on equity indicate good management and a strong underlying value, while low returns may signal a less successful company. It is very important to look back at least 5 to 10 years, in my opinion. To sum it up, we can say there are four important things to highlight. The first one is high returns on equity. Buffett looks for companies that have high returns on equity, as this indicates that the company is making good use of the money that shareholders have invested in the business. The second is proper allocation of retained earnings. Buffett also looks at how management is using retained earnings, as an efficient allocation of retained earnings will increase the underlying value of the business. And the third one is low debt. Buffett prefers companies with low levels of debt, as this reduces the risk of financial trouble. And the fourth one is proper use of leverage. Buffett avoids companies that heavily rely on leverage to generate earnings, as they may appear profitable in the short run, but ultimately prove to be unsustainable in the long run. As I said in the beginning, I was inspired to do this video from a book. I found the book to be incredibly informative and easy to understand, and it inspired me to create this video series on reading financial statements like Warren Buffett. If you are interested in purchasing the book, I highly recommend buying it through the Amazon link provided in the description below. Not only will you be supporting this channel by using my affiliate link, but you will also be taking a step towards becoming a more financially savvy investor. So that was it for today, and I hope you liked it. If you did, please leave a like and subscribe. Other than that, I'll see you in the next one.